I think it was Jonathan Swift who said he was a bold man that first ate an oyster. And he's not wrong because they don't look all that appetizing. But in the 19th century, they couldn't get enough oysters. They ate them everywhere, at home, in restaurants, on the street, even in brothels. And they ate them in all sorts of ways, including this recipe from 1880 for baked oysters in their shells. So thank you to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video as we explore the oyster craze and oyster panic of New York City, this time on Tasting History. So people often ask me what inspires me to do a certain episode, and honestly it's usually just whatever strikes my fancy on any given week. But this episode's a little different because it is inspired by my family. It turns out that in the 19th century my ancestors were oyster planters in New York City. And I learned this from Jarrett Ross over at Genia Vlogger who is going to be doing an entire episode all about my family history. And actually, that episode should be up when this one is. I still haven't watched it, but I'll put a link in the description to where you can watch it. I will be watching it at the same time. Now, he really hasn't told me what he's found out about my family except for one thing, and that is this census from 1870, which shows that my great-great-great-grandfather, Edward Johnson, was an oyster planter. Also, can we just take a moment and marvel at the penmanship of this census taker? Truly jealous of that skill. Anyway, I was curious about how some of these oysters that my ancestors were planting would be served at that time. So I found a recipe from 1880 from Miss Parloa's new cookbook for oysters served in escallop shells. The shells may be tin, granite ware, or silver plated, or the natural oyster or scallop shells. Drain all the liquor from the oysters into a stew pan, let it come to a boil, and skim. Then add the cream with which the flour should first be mixed. Let this boil two minutes and add the butter, salt, pepper, and nutmeg, and then the oysters. Take from the fire immediately. Have the shells buttered and sprinkled lightly with crumbs. Nearly fill them with the prepared oysters, then cover thickly with crumbs. Put the shells in a baking pan and bake 15 minutes. Serve very hot on a large platter, which garnish with parsley. So these oysters are served hot, and they are one of those few things that are just as good served hot as they are served cold. Just like the delicious coffee that I got from today's sponsor, Trade. Trade is a subscription service that delivers freshly roasted coffee right to your door from more than 55 independent roasters from all across the United States. You tell them what you're looking for in a coffee and how much coffee you drink, and then they curate a feed of coffee that is roasted and shipped directly to your door within 48 hours, so it's always fresh. Like this organic Blue Boon coffee who roasts their beans right here in Los Angeles. It's nice and light and has a chocolatey blend, which is exactly what I look for in a coffee. I don't like anything too, too dark, so this was right up my alley. And right now, Trade is offering a free bag of coffee to any viewer of Tasting History who signs up for a subscription using my link, drinktrade.com slash maxmiller. That is drinktrade.com slash maxmiller, because that is my name. And just as coffee is something that you can enjoy all year round, so are oysters, despite the fact that William Butler claimed it is unseasonable and unwholesome in all months that have not R in the name to eat oysters. But that rule really comes from a time before refrigeration and before you could get oysters from all over. You were dependent on your local oysters, and so if it was spawning season, they, they weren't as good. They wouldn't make you sick, but they were kind of anemic and watery. But now you can get oysters from anywhere, and so there's always some good oysters to be had. And for this recipe, you'll need about a dozen or so of those good oysters. Then one cup or 235 milliliters of cream, one cup or 120 grams of dried breadcrumbs, a half tablespoon or seven grams of butter, plus some extra for lining the oyster shells, a quarter teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of pepper, an eighth teaspoon of nutmeg, and one tablespoon of flour. And I know I didn't read all of the quantities that she gave, but she is very specific in how much of everything to put in the recipe. So now to get started is, is really the hardest part because it involves shucking oysters and full transparency until today I had never shucked an oyster. Now a 19th century cookbook from New York's Delmonico's restaurant says, the proper way to open them is to place the deep shell in the palm of the left hand and break them on one side. The Boston stabbing knife is preferable for this. 
Now I don't have a Boston stabbing knife, but oh my gosh, do I want one. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to use a regular old shucking knife. So it's best to wear a glove and or a folded up towel while you do this, just so you don't stab yourself. Then grab the oyster by the big end and insert the knife into the joint at the back. Don't insert it too far because you can pierce the oyster, but you need to get it far enough in so that when you twist it, it pops. Once it pops, you can gently run the knife around the edge just to open it up, then pour off the oyster juice into a saucepan, you're gonna need that later, and use the knife to cut the oyster from the shell, saving both the oyster and the shell as well. Like I said, this was my first time shucking an oyster, so I'm probably not the best teacher. There are definitely better ways that you can learn exactly how to do this process. Probably the best way would be to go back to the 19th century and watch some of the amazing oyster shucking competitions. One champion could open an astonishing 2,300 oysters in two hours, 18 minutes, 19 and a half seconds, all without breaking one shell. Which is super impressive because, again, it's my first time and I think the fastest I got was like 45 seconds, maybe 30. But once all your oysters are shucked, wash out and dry the deep side of the shell, and then take some softened butter and lightly butter the inside and sprinkle it with breadcrumbs. Then add the flour into the cream and whisk it until well dissolved and set it aside. Then put the saucepan of oyster liquor, that's what that's called, oyster liquor, over a medium heat and bring it to a simmer, skimming anything off the top. Then add the cream and flour mixture and whisk until dissolved and let it return to a simmer just around the sides and whisking the whole time, let it cook for two minutes. Then add in the half tablespoon of butter, the salt, pepper, and the nutmeg and whisk everything together. And finally, add in the oysters and immediately take it off the heat and transfer an oyster into each of the prepared shells along with a proportionate amount of the cream sauce. Then cover them all thickly with breadcrumbs. Now you'll notice that the dish that I used is like especially made for holding oysters and putting them into the oven. It's perhaps the most specific piece of, uh, of baking ware, bakeware that I, that I have. And frankly, you don't need that because you can just get a dish that can go into the oven, fill it with either dry rice or, or rock salt, and then you can kind of nestle the oysters in there. And, it's a lot easier, uh, or at least a lot cheaper, than, than going out and buying one of these dishes, unless you make a lot of oysters. But whatever you use, set the dish in the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 205 Celsius, and bake them for 15 minutes. And while they bake, I want to recommend a book called The Big Oyster by Mark Kurlansky. He writes some of my favorite food history books. His, his book Salt is just... You can't, it is one of the best things ever. Um, but anyway, he wrote an entire book just on oysters in New York City. It's phenomenal, and it is where I got a lot of the information for today's episode. So if you need more history, and who doesn't, go check out that book. But for now, here's a bit of the history of the oyster. So New York City has a long history with oysters. When Europeans first arrived, they remarked on what they saw that were called middens. And those are small hills of oyster shells. And these hills of oyster shells only grew once the Dutch and later the English settled there. In 1748, Swedish explorer Per Kalm wrote about seeing heaps of oyster shells everywhere and observed farmers plowing them into their soil. This was because while they could be eaten, it was actually the lime that was inside of the shells that was so precious. The burning of oyster shells to get that lime became such a common occurrence that as early as 1719, there was talk about how it could completely deplete the oyster beds around New York City. And there were laws enacted to protect the beds, claiming that it will tend to great benefit of the poor people because the poor of New York relied on it as a food source, because you could just go out into the water and get dinner. Luckily, the dependence on the lime finally subsided, and they remained just for eating. New York oysters became so popular up and down the eastern seaboard that every time a new bed was discovered, the newspapers covered it as if someone had just struck oil. The Great Oyster Placer! Millions of dollars worth found! Great excitement along shore! Oysters is oysters. They are for sale in considerable quantities in the city of New York and are prepared for eating at sundry places from Buttercake Dicks to Delmonico's. I feel like a business called Buttercake Dicks just, just wouldn't survive today. Or it would be a big hit. Anyway, they had to keep finding new oyster beds because 
they continued to eat through them. Sometimes within a few years, an entire oyster bed would be completely gone. One of the most famous of these was in 1827, when an abnormally strong tide revealed the Saddle Rock oyster bed. And these were not only delicious, but they were massive. Where most oysters took about 250 to fill a bushel, these took 25. Because they were so big and so delicious, they were completely eaten through in just five years. But they were very expensive, up to 30 cents a piece. And so people who had been selling them and now didn't have any to sell, just slapped the name Saddle Rock on pretty much any large oyster from New York. When the author William Thackeray ate one of New York's gargantuan oysters, he likened it to swallowing a baby. But despite that rather graphic description, people in New York just couldn't get enough of them, and everyone throughout society ate them. In 1857, British author Charles McKay said that the only distinction was that the rich consume oysters and champagne, the poorer classes consume oysters and lager beer. But another distinction was where the different classes were eating the oysters. First and foremost were the oyster saloons. The stranger cannot but remark the great number of oyster saloons, oyster and coffee saloons, and oyster and lager beer saloons, which solicit him at every turn to stop and taste. In these, as in hotels, oysters as large as a lady's hand are to be had at all hours, either from the shell, as they are commonly eaten in England, or cooked in twenty, or perhaps in forty, or a hundred different ways. But not all oyster saloons, sometimes called oyster cellars, were created equal, as many earned a reputation of being places of ill repute. In fact, the term, the Red Light District, might come from the oyster houses of New York and London. In both cities, it was customary for red lights to be hung in the windows of oyster saloons. The oyster sellers, with their bright lamps casting broad gleams of red light across the street, are now in full tide, and every instant sees them swallow up at one entrance a party of rowdy and half-drunken young men on their way to the theater, the gambling house, the bowling saloon, or the brothel, or most likely to all in turn. And eventually, many of the oyster sellers just became brothels themselves, though still always serving oysters. But it wasn't always the case that oyster saloons had this reputation. There were a few that were quite reputable, the most famous being Downing's, run by Thomas Downing, the son of former enslaved parents in Virginia. He traveled north to Philadelphia and then to New York, where in 1825 he opened his oyster saloon at 5 Broad Street in the Financial District. And it was a stop on the Underground Railroad. In the cellars of the restaurant, Thomas and his son George hid numerous enslaved people on their flight to Canada. It was also the only oyster bar in New York City where women who were not looking for clients could go to eat oysters, provided they were accompanied by their husbands. They were not allowed in alone, and they wouldn't be for some decades until a women-only oyster bar called the Ladies' Oyster Shop opened. Now, should you not want to visit a brothel-like oyster cellar, and you don't have the money to go to a place like Downing's or Delmonico's, well then, you would head to the markets. Washington and Fulton Market had oyster stands where you could either buy them to take, or more often, could be broiled or steamed right there. And even after everything else in the markets had closed down, they would be selling oysters through the wee hours of the morning. Here and there you pass on toward the Beekman Street front of the market, little oyster establishments are in full operation under the arcade. The glowing braziers look very comfortable this chilly night, and it is not easy to resist the urgent invitation of the artist who is engaged in frying scallops for a night customer who sits inside the little stall. So many oysters and other shellfish were eaten there on the spot that their discarded shells would make little dams in the gutters and would let sewage and trash and other things accumulate and became quite a health hazard. And in 1866, the Washington market was described as the terrible old huddle of abomination and purulence and slime. The structures were so ramshackle, they seemed near collapse. Now, while oysters enjoyed their popularity, there was a period 
where they really lost favor, and that was called the Oyster Panic of 1854. See, in the 19th century slums of New York, bouts of pestilence like cholera, typhus, and yellow fever were common and often blamed on the squalor, the poverty, and the perceived immorality of the people living in those areas. But in 1854, the pestilence moved uptown. There is a strange flare-up of this epidemic just now among people of the more respectable class. And while in the poor neighborhoods they blamed disease on immorality, in the richer neighborhoods, they blamed it on oysters. The Oyster Panic! It is a solemn time when men refuse to eat oysters on invitation. How doleful the saloons seemed yesterday. Now the ground of all this panic is a rumor that there is a sickness caused by eating oysters prevalent, and that it has caused five deaths. The more we follow up these rumored cases of sickness, the less definite they seem. Now, there are plenty of things that could have been blamed for this outbreak, but oysters definitely bore the brunt. And as, in this case, it was cholera, as cholera is often spread from food, eating food that has been tainted by sewage, and oysters grow in water that at this time was filled with sewage, it is possible that they had led to the outbreak. But instead of looking to the polluted water and cleaning it up as a solution, they looked to the calendar, and in 1855 revived an old law that stated that any month that didn't have an R in it could not have oysters be sold. And from May 1st to September 1st, no oysters could be sold in New York City. Though by the time it was time for the law to, to go into effect, it had been like seven months since the oyster panic had taken place and people had kind of forgot about it, and so they didn't really listen and pay attention to the law. In fact, oyster sellers started spelling August, August, just to, to get around it. Now, with the oyster panic in the past, the second half of the 19th century saw oyster consumption go to new heights. And it wasn't just in New York, but the entire country, because with train travel, they were able to take oysters from the coast and get them inland before they would spoil. A lot of oysters were eaten in places like Chicago and St. Louis. London and Paris, too, were having an oyster renaissance, the city of London alone consuming an estimated 700 million oysters a year. The problem was that in 1866, the entirety of England produced only 40 million oysters, so the rest had to be made up of American oysters. And between England, the American West, and New York City itself, the oyster beds around the city were beginning to seriously deplete by the end of the century. And between overconsumption and the growing sewage problem, New York oysters really fell out of favor, and eventually, by the 1920s, jobs like my great-great-great-grandfather's oyster planter pretty much went away. Until very recently, when there has been a concerted effort to revive the oyster beds in the waters around New York City. And who knows, maybe one day in the near future, the oyster saloons and oyster cellars of New York will return with their red lights and their dishes of oysters like the ones I'm about to eat right now. So after 15 minutes of baking, turn on the broiler for about one minute just to darken up the breadcrumbs, and then they're ready to eat. And here we are, baked oysters from 1880. They got a good crust on them, though I think maybe like panko breadcrumbs would actually uh, get a better crusting, but either way, they look good. Here we go. Mmm. 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 <laughs> so the flavor is wonderful. Creamy, but you get that oyster taste, that kind of, you know, it's, it's like being at the ocean. But then the creaminess of the of the sauce. The reason I laughed is usually when you eat a raw oyster, you don't want anything gritty in there because that is like sand or bits of shell. Here, there is something gritty and it's the breadcrumbs. So, so it's a little it's a little bit of an odd texture to have with with the oysters. But once you get past that, you're glad that they're there because they do add texture, though I'm actually not sure if they need it because the flavor is wonderful. They're so delicate and they're, they're nice plump oysters. Some were definitely better than others when I was, when I was shucking them. Uh, some were a little anemic um, and, and that kind of happens. Hopefully if you go to a restaurant, 
they're, they're chucking those out or putting them into a stew or something. But here, I used all the oysters. So if you like oysters, go ahead and make them. If you don't like oysters, go ahead and make something else. And I will see you next time on Tasting History.